Welcome to the Inspired by Adventure podcast, bringing you the adventure across the airwaves. Here's your host, Cole Watkins. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Inspired by Adventure podcast. I am your host, Cole Watkins, and today we have a very special guest, world-renowned artist, marine biologist, author, filmmaker, explorer, businessman, the legend himself, Dr. Guy Harvey. How are you doing? Cole, thank you very much. Uh, Pleasure to be on your Inspired by Adventure podcast today. Really been looking forward to it for quite a while. You liking our new uh, podcast, our new podcast room here? I love it. Yeah. (laughs) We've got like soundboards all over the walls. We've yep. nice mics. We're uh we're sitting pretty in here. Right. But uh thanks for hopping on the call today, guy. And uh, you know, we want we want this this episode just to be all about you. We want to learn, you know, everything about you. Uh you definitely, of course, uh have an interesting story that not everyone knows yet. So we wanna just dive in. So uh why don't you go ahead and start us off? Okay. Uh I, I'll give a, a brief introdu- introduction, uh, but feel free to stop and ask questions. I work much better when you or you know the the audience ask questions about specific things. So, without rambling too much. Um, okay, well let's get going. I'm I'm a tenth generation Jamaican. My family got to Jamaica in 1664, and I was very fortunate to grow up with a family that that farmed and fished and loved the outdoors, basically. Uh, my mother was a very ardent naturalist, a keen bird watcher, and quite an unaccomplished artist in her own right. And the art part actually runs also on my father's side, which I, I later discovered. But in early childhood, growing up in this amazing upland country side of Jamaica with, with all the lush rainforests around and, and nature, it was very inspiring. But we lived in a remote location, and so... The first school experience I really had was uh, going to Kingston, which is uh, 120 miles away, the capital, and boarding with another family. And from that time on, I have really spent a full year anywhere. And um, until the pandemic came along, (laughs) ironically, and for the last 10 months, I have not left this spot. And so it's been the longest time since about 19... 1960, and I've been in one place for more than half a year. Wow. And I put that time to good use, which we'll come to. So we were sent away to boarding school in England at the age of eight. Um, I remember being terribly homesick. And at school, I would um, dive into paintings and sketches of subject matter with which I was familiar. Mm-hmm. And that involved a lot of fishing and snorkeling from an early age. So I I really got off to a good start, not knowing where it would lead from those early days and would spend every summer holiday I had at home for 15 years, uh, immersed either on or in or beside the water, not really spending that much time on the farm. And we loved fishing. And in those days, of course, we killed everything. (laughs) Um, All the blue marlin tournaments, uh, we racked the fish up, but they they were not wasted. They were completely consumed. Um, They still are, by the way, in in developing countries. But it it sowed the early seeds of um, an interest in marine sciences. And I pursued uh, a marine science option all the way through um, junior school, prep school, really, high school and university. I I did my first degree in Aberdeen in Scotland, which is very appropriate because it had, at the time, the largest fish market in Europe was just down the road from the university. And we did a lot of work down um, in the commercial docks there. And then I went back home to Jamaica in 1978 to begin my doctorate, uh, working with the Fisheries Ecology Research Program, sponsored by the British government, to do a comprehensive study of the pelagics, coastal pelagic species around Jamaica. And I finished that by 1984. And in the meantime, I was that the grant ran out. And so I was having to be quite resourceful (laughs) in terms of generating income. I worked at a marina for a year, but I found out that my art had a certain appeal and started selling bits and bobs at different um, informal exhibitions and at fishing tournaments in Jamaica and did okay. Until I had my first one-man art show in Kingston 
1985, which really opened my eyes to the uh, potential. And from that, I exhibited in Fort Lauderdale and I never looked back from, for the next year, I was deciding should I continue with the science as a lect university lecturer, a professor, or should I go into the art full time? And by 1988, I resigned from university, uh, signed contracts in America and took up the art full time. Worked with that call for 10 years before um, I sort of regained my, I left academia, I regained my connections with academia by joining up with Nova Southeastern University at the Oceanographic Center in 1999. And we formed the Guy Harvey Research Institute. So it was, it was a, a welcome sort of, um, I don't know, return back to academia because I'd missed it. But through all, the, all our business connections, um, our, our research opportunities, and later our educational initiatives, my role as a, as, a, as a teacher has just continued where I left off pretty much. And we can get into some of that detail, you know, through the questions you're going to ask. Um, and it's, it's just grown from strength to strength. This is our 22nd year now of working with Nova. And, um, you know, some big steps have been, been made on research and education uh, during that process. I think the fundamental thing to understand is that the, the animals that we studied and spent time and effort on, largely on sharks and different species of sharks, is because we, there's an urgency in, in getting to know more about the animals that have been so reduced by overfishing, um, learning about their biology better so that we can better manage the resources, many of which are still commercially fished heavily. And so we need to put some guardrails around them. Um, moving to Cayman was another big deal that happened in 1999 as well. Um, Jamaica, having lived 21 years in, in Kingston, um, it had its challenges. And a lot of people ask me why I left. And I, I think the safest diplomatic answer is that the advantages of living in Jamaica were overtaken by the disadvantages. And so you can imagine, you know, the good and the bad. Sure. Being here has been remarkable in terms of um, more inspiration for for my art, for my research work, uh, for the, the, the brand generally. And I have no regrets, uh, though I miss family and friends in Jamaica. And we still go back a great deal. So from a business perspective here as well, we have a, um, a large presence, a gallery, uh, our flagship store, in fact. Mm -hmm. And prior to the pandemic, we did extremely well with um, a lot of visitors coming to Cayman because it's such a nice place to come and dive and spend time, it's very family orientated, it's safe, it's clean. Um, and we have a, you know, a very good reputation in that sector. And of course, you know, the aggressive fleet started here. In fact, Wayne Hassan, my dear friend, the late Wayne Hassan, and was one of the main influences back in the mid nineties uh, for getting me to come over here. And um, I've always been grateful to Wayne and Anne uh, for the introduction to Cayman. Really? Very good. Yeah. What year did you say that it was that you first went over there? I first came to Cayman in about 1983, 84. In fact, Wayne Hassan had come over to Jamaica to fish the International Marlin Tournament in Port Antonio. And um, he and his team came first and they set a new record, biggest marlin for a long time, over 500 pounds. Mm -hmm. And he said, you need to come to Cayman and have a look. In fact, when we actually did, he drove me around and he was trying to find us a place to, to buy and live. Um, but we maintained, you know, communication. We did many dives together, many fam trips together. Uh, we, we brought many groups on the aggressive fleet in different, um, <clears throat> different destinations, which have been fantastic. So did you meet Wayne Hassan at the, uh, the Marlin competition? Yes, yeah, really? 1982, uh, October. Uh, okay. Interesting. I didn't, yeah. know, I didn't know any of that. I've never even heard. I've never heard the Marlin story. But that's very cool. Yeah, and um, I, I got a picture of him somewhere standing next to this big fish. He worked with um, Kent Eldemar, uh, Casa Burtmar, and some other operation. Okay. Um, yep. Well, tell tell us what what you guys have been doing as as of late with the uh, with the foundation and the brand. I know you, both your kids seem. Uh, 
to be very involved as well. Thankfully, both uh, Jessica, who is now 30, and Alexander, who's 28, work for me. Jessica works in the foundation side. She's pro project manager here in Grand Cayman, or Cayman Islands. And Alex works on the for business side. He has a degree in business and marketing. Um, he got that at um, um, in Wales at Cardiff University. And Jessica went to uh, Edinburgh University, which is pretty close to where I went. So they've, they've had a, a well-rounded education. Um, Jessica's a, a zoologist and so understands all of this stuff. She worked for the Department of Environment here for nearly four years on the government side. And so has all the connections, not only locally, but throughout the Caribbean with, with similar organizations and has been an asset. Um, she's taking over more of the responsibility that, that I have done in uh, choosing projects, running existing projects, and has played a big part in our new educational initiative, not only here in Cayman, but also in Florida. And it will go to many different states um, as the project grows. Alex, um, climbing the ladder, obviously I hope to sort of hand over the reins to him in, in another five years and um, spend more time fishing and diving <laughs> myself. Um, so it's good to have them both here. We have an office in Fort Lauderdale that administers the licensing programs, which is our main business model, um, and the foundationals, which supports the foundation side as well. The foundation has an office there too, but we work out of the Guy Harvey Oceanographic Center in Fort Lauderdale, um, which is part of the NSU, Nova Southeastern Organization. It's directed by Professor Mahmoud Shivji, with whom I've worked since 2000, so 21 years now. He's a shark scientist, geneticist of great repute, and we have initially piggybacked along with some of his research projects, then initiated our own, obviously as funding really made a lot more happening. And as the business became more successful and we, we got more sponsorship so we could do more. And everything so far, Cole, is, you know, is, is limited by the amount of money you can raise. The species we chose to study, which are the large pelagics, sharks, billfishes, and tunas, are, have accessibility issues okay. in terms of cost and duration of time in the field and all of that. So we've bitten off a, a really tough project, well, many tough projects to study. Um, we've done really well. We've done a lot of work on tracking tiger sharks very successfully. We discovered how they roam the oceans just as much as they spend time in shallow water. Wasn't known for that. Uh, we worked on oceanic white tips. We worked on silky sharks, uh, white sharks. Uh, we've got a lovely project going in Mexico right now on whale sharks, tracking whale sharks, using um, electronic transmitters to, to track them. Um, the key ingredient here being all these animals spend a lot of time at the surface. And so with the transmitters attached to the dorsal fins, we do actually hear from them on a regular basis. Obviously, when you track an air-breathing animal like a porpoise, a dolphin, or a turtle, you're going to have a lot of hits because they have to go to the surface a lot. Oh. Not, not the same with a blue marlin or a bluefin tuna. Okay. Um, uh, Mahmoud has, has you know, been very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, influential in getting NOAA to adopt a lot of better management practices for mako sharks, for example, one of our biggest studies that we, done, we did in the Yucatan and in uh, the mid-Atlantic area of the northwestern Atlantic Ocean. We changed the legislation for how mako sharks are fished, uh, minimum sizes, um, and we're looking for improvements on that because of their overfish nature. Probably one of the most significant things Mahmoud ever did was to infiltrate the Hong Kong shark fin trade where mm -hmm. all the shark fins end up having been caught all over the world yeah. and by extrapolation come up with a figure of the number of sharks that are killed each year in, in the shark fin trade which is somewhere between 55 and 73 million sharks per year and that figure is quoted by a number of different authors and it came from Mahmoud it's it's a startlingly high figure but right. it doesn't include a lot of the other shark fishing um, extraction projects that happen around the world. So um, the shark fin trade is still, you know, the bad guy in the overall picture for, for the health of the oceans. 
Um, and then, yeah, and then we've got some local projects going here in Cayman. Um, we filmed the, the Nassau group of sporting aggregations for 10 years straight here up in Little Cayman. Uh, we did two documentaries. We invited Sir Richard Branson here in 2017 to come and see that so he could export this amazing success story, one of the true success stories of uh, coral reef conservation in the Caribbean that has, that has happened right here in, in Grand Cayman. Uh, we've done the Stingray project that's lasted for 19 years. We've done <clears throat> other shark projects here. And we made many educational documentaries. And Jessica is the host of many of those because she's young, attractive, has a you know, great rapport. And so that's what's really been happening in a nutshell. Um, I, you know, having spent two decades on the research front, uh, we have so much footage and data and stuff now that we need to content that we need to make accessible to uh, the public, especially the younger generations, K through 12. Um, and we have now the mechanism to make that all happen. It's a very exciting stage in our um, evolution. Yeah. And, and, you know, you did touch on uh, a little bit real quickly there on the education uh, and, and the initiatives that you guys are doing. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, in the past, we have spent about 80% of our budget on research because you've got to have the data to be able to educate and therefore to um, exercise conservation. Because without the data, you, you don't really know where you are with any species or any habitat. Or, so it's fundamental to the whole process. Um, that's why the emphasis was put there. But as I grow older and um, as we see the need for more um, changes to take place and just people's attitude, the education, the, the, the knowledge will do that. And we will if, be much better at affecting conservation through the educational option. It's also a lot easier to raise money for school kids than it is to raise money to research fish. Fish are still perceived as cold and smelly. And, um, and so it's very hard, no, honestly, to, to get real meaningful figures for fishery research work. It's been a struggle. So here's another option for us. Um, and as we work with other like-minded organizations, um, you know, th there are a number in Florida. We signed up with Discovery Education, for example. We're now a big part of their, um, their curriculum. And there are other people uh, with whom we're working, the, the Florida Department of Education, uh, Florida Virtual School, lots of people like that. And we're going to do well with this. Very interesting. The, uh, the only other aspect about the research work is we, we've chosen animals that are long-lived and slow-growing. Most sharks um, are long-lived, slow-growing animals. Um, and so you can't study them for a year or two years. You have to study them for a decade or, or more, as we have done, and to get the, the, the full picture. And as, we've, as we do this, we've learned that Whale sharks, for example, can live longer than 100 years. Really? <laughs> so, mako sharks, 20, 30 years. Tigers, 30, 40 years. Um, stingrays, 50 years. So, these have been serious investments in uh, the acquisition of knowledge. That's very cool. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit of, more about some of these facts that you you guys have learned on the on these animals. Like, which, which ones are you saying seeing that tend to... Uh, to do a little more exploring and which ones kind of seem, seem to stay put. Well, let's, let's take the mako shark, for example. Here is a, a highly evolved animal. What one of four um, in its family, the Isuridae or the, uh, the mackerel sharks. Um, it's a close relative to the white shark. Then you have the poor beagle and the salmon shark. They all fit and the short fin mako. They all fit into the same family. Uh, they're, they're partially warm-blooded, so they're highly evolved. They can withstand you know, very cool water and hunt successfully, uh, a bit like a bluefin tuna. Uh, they're made for speed. The maker, of course, is the fastest of all the sharks, and it's a predator of many of the other oceanic predators, like swordfish and tunas and billfish and jacks and stuff like that. Well, they also happen to taste good because of what they eat, so they are preferentially killed by commercial long lining. And their numbers have plummeted uh, probably a bit faster than many other species in the last two decades. Um, slow growing animal, live long time, 
uh, reach first maturity at a late stage, maybe 10 years, 12 years. So these sharks are a bit like human beings and they live for a long time and they have a few young. We caught and applied these spot tags on the dorsal fins of many of them, over 110 individuals now, and track them. And you can go on our website. It's ghritracking.org okay. and see all of those, all of the tracks we've ever done. Uh, billfishes, tuners, sharks, um, it's all there. And you'll see just how far they range. 10, 12,000 miles a year is nothing for some of these animals. Well, in, in, in this process, we lost 30% of the mako sharks to fishermen. And we know they died because the, 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 uh, the tags ended up on land. Now, that mortality rate was 10 times higher than any previous estimate of NOAA's mortality rate of mako sharks. Um, and this is, remember, a fishery independent estimate. You're not relying on the fishermen to report the catches. This is um, a study done aside of you know, any commercial interest. So it's pretty accurate. And of course that promoted um, the, the, the requirements for change, increase the minimum size that people can keep, mandate the, the release of any fish that are alive on haulback by commercial fishing interests. Um, and that's just an intermediate measure while we test you know, how effective that result, those measurements, <clears throat> those requirements are in terms of you know, the overall catch rates of these animals. So that took eight years to get to that point. You know? So it's a long-term study, but now change is happening. The whale sharks have become very, very sexy in the shark ecotourism business because you can now go and swim with whale sharks in about nine or 10 different locations around the world um, where you have these aggregations of sharks on a seasonal basis, depending on food availability. One of them happens to be right off Cancun or Isla Mujeres in uh, the Yucatan in the Caribbean. And this place has just shot upwards in terms of popularity because of the number of sharks that show up there each year. And we're working with a Mexican counterpart to tag these sharks with the same spot tags and track them where they go to after they leave the feeding aggregations, which are typically in the summertime and they're feeding on fish eggs and so on. So why is this important? Well, shark ecotourism enables jurisdictions and small island states, states to uh, benefit from interactions with these animals safely um, and people to generate a living um, without killing a single animal. And here's, here's a turnaround in terms of the, the use and the value of marine resources uh, to, to benefit sustainably uh, local populations. And of course, interactions with these animals um, inspires more conservation because they are just, you know, the, the experience of swimming with a, with a tiger shark or a lemon shark or a reef shark or a whale shark is inspiring to many people. Sure. Um, and not just professionals like myself, but the ordinary person. You're not in an aquarium looking through a, um, a glass at an animal, you're in the ocean with it. So the, the, the whole study of these interactions uh, from a scientific perspective, not an aesthetic perspective, is critically important to the sustainability of the interactions. Could For, for someone who may be unaware, could you kind of tell us a little bit about how the ecosystem is affected when, all, when we're seeing these, this drop of sharks with the shark finning? just for someone that may be unaware of. For sure. Yeah. There are about 513 known species of sharks around the world right now, and they, they inhabit all aspects of the marine and to an extent freshwater habitats. They're extremely successful group of animals, and they've been around for more than 400 million years. And so that's a long, long, long time. And they've, their sort of morphology, their physiology, hasn't really changed that much. So their design is extremely successful. And we're studying actually one of those aspects of that, which is their, their resistance to um, cancer and tumors and stuff like that, and how they heal so rapidly having sustained an injury, for example. And we see that with sharks and rays and sharks. So here, here's an animal 
that is, has just survived miraculously through all this time yeah. until what? <laughs> Human interactions, commercial fishing, overexploitation. They haven't had to replace themselves faster than a, a few pups every couple of years um, because there's, there's not been that level of extraction or predation ever exercised on them in 400 million years. They survived all of the, the, the stuff that, that nature has thrown at them for all this time until we came along. So they, in, in their different habitats, um, they are obviously the regulators. They're all predators. Um, even the larger sharks, like the basking shark and the whale shark, which are planktonivorous, plankton is still mostly animals, so that they're, they're all predators. Um, and they, they fulfill a very effective role in sort of maintaining the equilibrium with all the, the different levels of animals in the food chain below them. So without them, things can really fall apart. It's as simple as that. Right. Um, so how could somebody who's, who's listening today, you know, that might want to help you guys out with the, the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation as far as a donation? Is, uh, what's the best way that somebody there could, could help you guys out? Make a donation on your website? or Yes. Well, thank, thank you for that, Cole. Uh, we, we have a, an elaborate website, one of which one component is tracking and the dissemination of data and education, one of which is, is listing all our projects, how you can help, how you can be involved. We have a fantastic group of volunteers here in Cayman, for example, that help us with a number of projects. But you know, every every five and ten dollar donation that you can make um, to the foundation on our donate um, icon is, of course, put to good use. Uh, is tax deductible through our five hundred one c three, and you feel good about doing it. Also, in purchasing any guy having merchandise or artwork or licensed item, you're also making a small contribution to the operations of the, of the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation. That's very cool. And it is, yeah. it really is, uh, you know, cause I was, I was thinking the other day when I was, you know, starting to study some of my notes, getting prepared for this call, like <laughs> I was knowing your name before I was in the, working at aggressor before I was a scuba diver, you know, I, I had a t-shirt of yours. Uh, my dad had a few as well. When 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 did you see the the merchandise really take off and really when it when it really surprised you that you know this is this could this is this is a big deal now? It it became that cool. It it began in 1986 with my first exhibition at the Fort Lauderdale International Boat Show. I was very lucky. The owner of the show became a very good friend, a board member of my foundation. Uh, just to show you how you start leaning finish fat so to speak was that um, that the Hemingway exhibit where you that was that was part of it uh the real Hemingway exhibit was in 85 in Jamaica okay. and then part of the Hemingway stuff came to the boat show and, and off we went from that but also through the late Scott Boyd and who was a, a very very good fisherman um, tackle store owner from Fort Lauderdale um and being a tackle store owner, he knew all the, the people who fished and the people with, you know, in the business. He connected me with a guy who is a world record holder, also passed away a couple of years back, called Raleigh Working, who owned uh, T-shirts of Florida. And I signed up with Raleigh in 1980, early 87 it was. And we worked together with that company for 16 years. Wow. And uh, Raleigh was a was a... I think he had over 50 different world records, different species. Raleigh also introduced me to Tropic Star Lodge in Panama, where we now have a, a very big, big project going uh, on the Pacific side. It's mostly a fishing, but we do some diving there as well, Cole. In fact, it's, it's probably the most famous fishing lodge in the Western Hemisphere for big game stuff. And I took Wayne Hassan down there with Davis uh, before he passed. Um, I've written a book about that. <laughs> Yeah. Very inspirational, very good fishing, and we've done a lot of work there. Um, but so in these early years, these co these connections were made, and the th through the licensing and the apparel, it just grew steadily. And then we changed to another manufacturer, AFCO, very big name in, in fishing, um, great reputation. They're, they're based in California, 
And we worked with them for 16 years. And then I moved to Intradeco, which is a Miami-based company. And we just started with them. And along comes a pandemic. And boy, it's been tough. But um, we're going to get through it. Okay. We, have, we have this you know, amazing library that I've built up over 35 years to draw on. We have um, all the technology, all the, the, the stuff that goes into modern day printing sublimation has just been a marvel um and and we make for men ladies kids everybody and so when once we get back on track and retails you know becomes a little more normal while e-commerce has sort of come to the come to the top now um we expect to be back in the in the front row again i, I think my brand developed a, a great well i know it developed a great deal of competition call so yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of options out there now, but those early years were, were really quite amazing to experience, to be honest with you. Yeah. Very cool. Do you ever see someone wearing your, uh, your merchandise and just walk up to them and say, hey, nice shirt? <laughs> <laughs> it's happened in the past. <laughs> um, no, it's, you know, Pete, it, it, it's a great business to be in because it, it's, it makes everybody happy. Yeah. Um, they, they love the product. They love the association. They love even more the connection to research and conservation. Uh, you know, everybody wants to see the resources in good shape. All of us, everybody who, who dives, fishes, boats, you know, hunts, whatever you do, they want, they want the resource to be healthy so that they can have access. And that's our goal too. So, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I would love to, I would love to talk a little bit about the books and the artwork. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Um, I, I use this pandemic 10 months at home without leaving to write a new book, 500, no, 350 pages. And so much was, uh, hit the cutting room floor. I'm going to probably do a couple more books out of it, hmm. but, um, it goes back two decades, takes us into all the research work, the, the early days of doing that, the TV series we used to do, um, and all the projects, all the art inspired by going to different destinations. I think five chapters feature uh, expeditions with Wayne Hassan on the aggressive boats. We got Galapagos, Cocos, which are my two favorite places to dive and fish. Okay. Um, we got Turks and Caicos, we got Cayman, um, Belize, and um, yeah, I think that's it. I never went to the to the Western Pacific with him, um, and a lot of artwork. The, the pages are stuffed with with photos that we've got, and um, especially the open ocean animals, the, the billfishes, tunas, shark, all sorts of sharks uh, stuff. But lots of art, um, and then of course painting. I've been painting every day. If if I could turn my camera around, I would show you. We um, here at the sandbar in Grand Cayman with no tourists out there going out there and feeding the rays with no other boat there. We're seeing a lot of different species of sharks come in to, you know, not in, not take the rays, but interact with us. Hmm. Um, and so it's been very inspirational. And of course I'm catching up on art that I want to do for myself and not just for our licensees because they can be pretty specific about what they need. In spite of the fact that we have, you know, a body of, um, amazing graphic designers who will manipulate the artwork nowadays to suit whatever vehicle it's going to go on. But uh, along that line, um, you know, I, the, the sort of group of wildlife artists is, is a growing body and there are two different organizations worldwide. <clears throat> One of which is called the Society of Animal Artists that's been going on for a long time, but you have to be nominated for that and accepted by um, a board okay. and there's about 300 members from 50 or 60 different countries and I've been a member of that for a long time and then there's the Canadian based organization called Artists for Conservation and you can google these organizations and they have about 500 members some of which are members of, of both like myself um, and they hold a lot of exhibitions every year annual traveling shows and for uh, at uh, reputable museums and so there's there's a side of the art business that's um that is more formal 
and you kind of need to be accepted in that regimen, that that sort of genre, okay. uh, you know, to to be, become you know well known. On the commercial side of it, which is sometimes frowned upon by by those members, it it provides stability in terms of the career as an artist and generating income. Because if you just paint to sell your paintings and maybe do a few limited edition prints, your income is very intermittent and it spikes. It, there's no regularity to it. Sure. And you know, people love regularity. So the licensing provides a wonderful cushion in terms of um, you know, your income, but also what you can do with, the, with your disposable income. And that's how the foundation was formed. Um, people would like to know that I, I started out with pen and ink work as a fish illustrator. Um, I quickly switched to adding watercolor to that. Watercolor, many people would say, is a very challenging medium to work with because it's so spontaneous. But I like that. I like I work fast and I like the spontaneity of it. And it's become my go-to medium for painting. Um, but many of the animals I love to paint are big and they demand a big canvas. So I will do 10 foot and 15 foot long canvases you know, with a blue marlin or a whale shark or predator prey interactions. Uh, and then I'll do some mixed medium actually on my calendar here. I have an example. I'm just trying to figure out January. There's a, a picture here of uh, some dolphin fish or mahi mahi. Okay, it's done in mixed media. So the background is all in acrylic on paper and all the fish, the log, the bait fish, they're all watercolor. So I'm painting around, um, leaving the white space on the paper for the dolphin fish. And the rest is all um, a different medium. Um, I will obviously be able to send you lots of B-roll and uh, images, you know, to, to help um, illustrate. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, you know, what we do here. Yeah. There's some of my, my favorite topic, the old man in the sea. Very cool. And on one of our expeditions with Wayne, we actually spent three days in Havana and uh, went to Hemingway's house in Finca Vahia. And um, Jessica, who'd never been to Havana before, enjoyed the tour and we, mm -hmm. we, um, we caught up on Hemingway's life. <laughs> Yeah, I've I've, I've yeah. been to that uh that that hotel, the Ambos Mundos Hotel. Yeah, then, yeah. <laughs> and then he bought the house, or his wife bought the house for him, and of course the pilar, the boat is there and all that. It's it's really amazing. Wouldn't you cre credit him to being what really got you first interested in into, into drawing, or was it the, or was it the uh you know the experiences with your parents or a good mix? Yeah. Cool. What, what happened was I, I quickly became fascinated with the blue marlin and to, to catch one in Jamaica in the, in the late fifties or early sixties with pretty basic tackle, you know, using linen line and old pen reels and star drags and all that well, it was a real challenge. And so your encounters were more frequent than they are now, but they would constantly get away. <laughs> okay. So to see one became a fixation with me. And I'll never forget seeing the first one caught by uh, my mother in, a, in the middle of a rainstorm on a friend's charter boat. And I was, I was dismayed because it, the bill had been broken off before, and so it had a very short little bill um, because the bill is the most influential thing, part of the, the, the billfish anatomy. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw a couple more caught. And then going away to boarding school, the opportunities were few and far between. <clears throat> to attend because the fishing tournaments always started, <clears throat> excuse me, after you went back to school. Okay. So once I had done with that, went to university, I didn't catch my first one until, <clears throat> I'm gonna say my first one was in 1973. So I was 17 then. Yeah. But going back to the, to the Hemingway story, my mom said, you love this fish, read this book by this guy called Hemingway and I was so taken away because at the age of, I think it was like 12 or 13, <clears throat> I couldn't believe that somebody would write so eloquently about this fish with which I was infatuated. And it had no uh, illustrations. And so by the time I was like 15, 16, I was doing sketches of this interaction, as I imagined, using my Jamaican uh, artisanal fishermen yeah. as kind of the models. 
um, for my 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 people. And then I about nine uh, nineteen seventy three I got the whole story done. I finished it off in one year, and sat on it until eighty five for the one man art show. And then in 1990, I produced it in book form to benefit the International Game Fish Association on whose board I sat for 28 years. Uh, just, just came off last year, actually. Time for some new blood there. Um, so it was to benefit them. And that, that's the full story. And of course, you know, we had it to sell in our armory as well. And it's, it's done really well, but it's all black and white. Um, I, I have it right here. I can show it to you, but Who would I'll send you some B-roll. <laughs> Yeah, if you got, if, yeah, if anything you want to show, it's fine because this, this yeah. is. Yeah, let me get it it's right here. <clears throat> so, very quickly. Yeah, no, no worries. I got all the time. Okay, good. I know you can edit this. And do it. So, this is it here. Whoops. It's called Santiago's Finest Hour. Okay. And, uh, I had permission from Hemingway's um, publisher, Simon and Schuster, to do this and, and use actually sections out of the book um, that I wrote in my handwriting. Let me just get that right on the camera. Whoa, there it is. Um, to match the illustration that I did, wow. and obviously pay a royalty to them as well. But um, it's, we reprinted this four times now. It's been really very successful. Wow. And I followed that in 2000, 2001 with my first autobiography, Portraits from the Deep, okay. which is the one I just finished doing the follow-up to this called Guy Harvey's Underwater World. And that takes us from 2002 to about present. And that's going to be coming out in May. And then I did, <clears throat> in 2011, I did uh, the illustrations for Fishes of the Open Ocean, which, there you go. Uh, with Australian, a famous Australian author called Julian Pepperell, with whom I worked uh, many times, fisheries scientist. And then there's a book on Panama, um, which came out as well. So this is my fifth book I've, I've just finished. Yep. So going back to you talking about being a young kid and deciding if you wanted to continue the artwork full time, right call, wasn't it? <laughs> it, it, it was... Um, you ever imagine what this would have turned into? I tell you, well, I could, I could have gone back to science pretty quickly um, had it not worked, but I'll never forget the first Fort Lauderdale boat show in 1986. I sold every piece of art I had in my, my booth wow. and I made more money than, um, than in like three years at university as a lecturer wow. and, you know, quickly formed two Florida corporations, which I still have. And, you know, it became, you know, an official business based in Florida, even, even though I never lived there. So, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Well, I love the Caribbean. I'm an island, island child, an island boy. And I, um, you know, we've, we've rented places. We had a house in, in Fort Lauderdale for a few years. But I love the Caribbean. And um, that's why, you know, when we left Jamaica, I couldn't leave the Caribbean. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, great. Well, I, I mean, I appreciate everything uh, you've, you've, you've taken. I, I, I didn't even expect to see some of your art, artwork there. So that was really cool to see that. Well, Is I, you know, I, I could give you a quick tour of the gallery here. My, well, it's my studio, but um, I'd have to lift that off. But um, I'm, I'm, yeah. I think that would be very cool if, if, if that's easy for you to do. I don't, I'm I, not sure how this is going to work, but let me just take the camera off of here and see what we do. Yeah, so I set up with my, my easels over here. Okay. And there's a lot of, obviously, you know, photos and uh, memorabilia, a ton of that stuff, actually, around as mounted fish um, and other people's work. And probably more important that um, people should know this, I, I've kept a very detailed record um, prior to electronic photos of all our expeditions, families, and stuff like that. Plus, I maintain, and for anybody who's serious about recording their life or the life of their family, a diary, uh, one page a day, 
and I've done that for 30 odd years. And it's been essential in terms of um, recall of details. And um, paper doesn't forget. And you, you back it up with your library of, of underwater photos, videos, topside photos, action photos. I mean, for example, when I go to Panama, I don't even touch a fishing rod. All I take is my Canon 5D and, um, and a long lens because I want to get action shots of all the billfish, the black marlins, jumping sailfish, roosterfish, whatever, um, because it's more challenging to get a really good action shot than to, you know, just wind the reel. Okay. So, you know, we're in the business of images anyway, and so that's another of my responsibilities is to be a very good photographer right. <laughs> and underwater cameraman. And thank God for GoPros because um, as they become more and more sophisticated, you're, the package that you're taking with you underwater is reduced while the quality is increased. In the old days, I used to push, you know, a Sony FX1 with a Gates housing that weighed 50 pounds. And it's not easy to do when you're, you're swimming in a, in a current or in the open ocean trying to capture images of fast moving creatures. Anyway, the, 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 the whole, the recording of information of what happens, what you see, what you do. Um, I can't emphasize how important it is to people who are, you know, always out or in or on the water um, and, and care about it and care about what you see and, you know, what you've done. Um, it's, it's a log. So my diary that I just showed you has become, this has become my dive log, my travel log, my art log, my fish log. Um, and without this, I could never write these, these lengthy books with such detail. Um, it would be impossible. Right. And just to finish the story about Tiger Beach, the whole Tiger Beach experience and Bahamas shark experience was a collaborative effort by the Bahamas National Trust with whom we work a great deal. Eric Carey is, you know, one of the, the strong men of the Bahamas. He's the director, um, CEO. We work with the Pew uh, Charitable Trust and ourselves providing all the scientific research to encourage the government to uh, protect sharks from commercial fishing in the Bahamas. That was in tw January 2011. And by July, uh, the government had ratified that and, um, and basically saved the shark population in the Bahamas because there was serious interest from different um, Asian operators to come into their 200 exclusive, their 200 mile exclusive economic zone and just lay waste. Uh, and in the book that I just finished, there's a huge chapter on the chronology of how in the early mid nineties, um, people like Stuart Cove, who, who really just started these shark interactive programs, mm -hmm. suffered at the hands of exploratory long line fishing within the Bahamas um, archipelago. And a lot of people there banded together, uh, including especially a lawyer called Pericles Melis, and they got the government to get rid of the commercial fishing from the, from the early 90s, which is why the Bahamas has so many sharks now. And that was added to in the, in the 2011 by the government saying, well, you know, no commercial fishing whatsoever will ever be allowed. And they have a burgeoning shark ecotourism business where they, they generate ooh, 100, $120 million a year from shark ecotourism. Over, I think it's 12 or 14,000 people a year come to dive with sharks. So that's giant business, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, before we start wrapping up, I did want to ask, uh, what's, what's been your experience with Aggressor over all these years? The Aggressor fleet has just gone from strength to strength. Um, we started out here. Uh, we've gone to the eastern tropical Pacific, my favorite place to dive. Um, been several times. <clears throat> Can't get enough of Cocos Island. And uh, went to a, a few of the other destinations. The, the expansion of the fleet, uh, of course, you know, just tells you how successful it's been. But I, I think it's the, on Cuba, of course, was our last one we did. I think it's the, the quality of the, of the vessels, the, uh, the, the, 
professionality of the staff, the hospitality, of course, of the staff. Um, and I think my favorite operation was, was the Galapagos one, to be honest with you. So the, the one in Cuba was very, very impressive. I was so impressive that it was entirely staffed by Cubans. Um, you could have taken them anywhere in the world and they would have competed with anybody from Belize or Hawaii or um, anywhere. Um, they were very, very well trained. Um, and everybody just has a fantastic attitude. And I know Wayne Brown and Wayne Hassan had a lot to do with that. Wayne, of course, was kind of the, the sort of, <laughs> he went to, I forget how many ships he's had a year, 16 a year he went to, um, to go and check on the quality. He was quality control. Yeah. <laughs> and he traveled more than me. Yeah. And that's, that's something. Yeah. But, you know, the, these people made the operations work and um, come hello high water, um, you had a really fantastic experience. I can't say enough about them. And of course, you know, the fact that they have conservation organizations embedded with the companies really helps too. Right, right. All right, well, I think that's going to wrap us up. Uh, Dr. Harvey, I want to thank you for being on the show today. And uh, this is a real treat for me to learn a little bit about you. Well, there's a lot more, <laughs> but I gave you the bare bones. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to have a great family to back me up as well. We just had our 32nd wedding anniversary on Saturday. Um, celebrated on the beach here at, at Luca on a, a beautiful, cool, sunny afternoon. And being COVID free here in Cayman, we're free to roam around the place and do whatever we want. And um, it's, it's really awesome. Um, so hopefully, if everybody gets the vaccine, uh, does their corporate, their uh, community, um, bit uh you know the the responsibility to the human race and get some vaccine then we'll be in a good shape in a year from now i think so as well yeah thank you for being on i will uh i will uh wrap it up from there and uh thank you you guys for listening to uh episode of inspired by adventure podcast great well thank you thank you cole thank you to all your listeners and i will um send you as much imagery or video footage or reference material that you need to fill out the, uh, the podcast. That would be great. That will, that will definitely uh, uh, spark it up a little bit. Good. All right. Great. Well, All the best. Have talk- a great 21. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning into the Inspired by Adventure podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you haven't already, please subscribe through iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. See you next time.